me in particular wanted to have this session because uh, I find that um, uh, even though I'm an economist and supposed to make big models and and uh, you know do these statistical estimations and stuff like that, that I learn a lot more from talking to the people who are actually developing innovations and putting those innovations to work. Uh, and and so I wanted to uh, to get some of the people that are involved in that process in Argentina here today and uh, and hopefully introduce some of our economists to the uh, the work that's actually going on in the ground. And um, uh, Facundo and I were, uh, Facundo has a, a similar interest being from the uh, ministry. Uh, and <clears throat> we thought, well, one of the things that, that uh, could be quite interesting is to uh, find out what some of the companies uh, from Argentina are doing in the area of of uh, climate change, reducing greenhouse gas impacts, and and contributing to the general uh, area of the development of the bioeconomy, uh, and so I was uh, really pleased when when uh, uh, we decided that you know we, we were able to get uh, some of you guys. I'm sorry we don't have a bigger audience, but uh, we have quality, not quantity. I think, um, and. Uh, um, so we're we're very uh, pleased to, to have you here. Uh, I think uh, Facundo is going to do the the sort of specific introduction of you guys, uh, and Facundo and I sort of put this together. And and uh, I guess in in fact it was uh, Facundo's idea to to have something focusing on on the environment and environmental impact. So um, I hope that um, that. You guys will stay with us for for some lunch afterwards, so we can have some further discussions, and uh, and I can introduce you to some more of the people that really should meet you. I think you know. So uh, thanks again for coming, and uh, Facundo, I will uh, let you do the introductions. Uh -huh. Here she is, <laughs> Maria. <laughs> We need another chair. Well, uh, I'm going to talk in Spanish, and if you don't mind, and I think the translator were paid, so. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos por, por estar aquí. Eh, bueno, este es un panel que, como decía Carr, eh, trata sobre la innovación eh, para, eh, el cambio, para la mitigación y la adaptación al cambio climático. Y acá, antes que todo, lo que tenemos son eh, dos grandes ejemplos de dos empresas argentinas innovadoras de, de primer nivel, que, que son Bioceres y BioEuris, que, ah, gracias, Agus. Aprovecho y me siento. Eh, bueno, pero que, creo que la, la introducción que, que me toca hacer a mí en, en, en este momento es eh, cómo desde la Secretaría de Agricultura se ha acompañado en estos más de 30 años a todo el desarrollo de la biotecnología agropecuaria en la Argentina, que es claramente un ejemplo de política de Estado que tiene continuidad y que ha creado o ha favorecido el desarrollo de este ecosistema biotecnológico que existe en la Argentina, y que, de los cuales las dos empresas que van a presentar son un claro, un claro ejemplo. Bueno, el primer hito es claramente la, la constitución en 1991 de la Comisión Nacional Asesora en Biotecnología Agropecuaria, la CONAVIA, la CONAVIA es la encargada dentro de la Secretaría de Agricultura, Ganadería y Pesca, dependiendo de la Dirección Nacional de Bioeconomía, que acá estuvimos a Dalia dando presentaciones anteriormente, pero también acá está en el público Perla Godoy, quien es la coordinadora de, de la CONAVIA. Eh, y la CONAVIA desde 1991 se anticipó a todos los desarrollos que venían en el mundo produciéndose 
y con una regulatoria de vanguardia, fue uno de los primeros países en adoptar esta, esta regulatoria, en, se, eh, se encargó de en llevar a, adelante todo el sistema normativo e institucional para el abordaje de estos productos que tienen que ver con la evaluación de los productos y luego su autorización para la comercialización de, de los mismos. Entonces, lo, lo, lo primero fue la instalación del sistema normativo y el acompañamiento del desarrollo con, estos, digamos, de, con, con todo este sistema normativo y con las políticas públicas para, para estos desarrollos. Después vino eh, la parte que tiene que ver con, a medida que iban sucediéndose nuevos desarrollos, va a hablar seguramente Carlos de lo que es la edición génica, o lo que se llama en inglés New Breeding Technique, también nuevas técnicas de mejoramiento, que son productos biotecnológicos que no son OGM, que están determinados como, como, como productos producidos por biotecnologías convencionales, por ende no pasan la carga regulatoria que tienen los, los OGM y que son claramente una oportunidad para pequeños y medianos desarrolladores, tanto del ámbito privado como público. Pero bueno, después lo dejo a Carlos que, que hable sobre eso. Eh, otra de las eh, políticas que, que ha tenido la Argentina en, nuestros en estos 30 años como para eh, favorecer el desarrollo del ecosistema biotecnológico ha sido claramente capacitando a terceros países en la construcción de capacidades de técnicos, funcionarios, en los sistemas regulatorios de otros países, en, ha sido Argentina, en, que, que fue reconocida por FAO como, como centro de bio, el único centro de bioseguridad de referencia a nivel mundial, y, y con eso bajo ese sello, la Argentina se ha encargado de capacitar a, a, a distintos países en la construcción de eso, de, de los sistemas normativos. Estos sistemas normativos han permitido en esos países luego evaluar y aprobar productos que Argentina comercia, que Argentina exporta. Entonces ha sido también el papel del Estado en ese sentido, en la construcción de capacidades ha sido muy importante. Luego en las negociaciones internacionales, tanto en las bilaterales, en las negociaciones para que haya sincronía en la aprobación de eventos, entre los eventos que se exportan y se importan, en, eso está sobre la mesa en todas las negociaciones bilaterales, sobre todo en los productos nacionales, en, se, se hace referencia. En, y también en las negociaciones multilaterales, pienso en el convenio de diversidad biológica, en el protocolo de Cartagena, donde se ponen en, en la mesa eh, ciertos documentos, algunos vinculantes, que si Argentina y el grupo de países a los cuales pertenece, de mismos intereses, no está despierto y no negocia en términos de que no sea algo perjudicial para nuestro país, eh, el tema, vamos, vamos sonados o sea, con, con la biotecnología, más con las oleadas de algo, que existen en algunas regiones y países en el mundo. Así que las negociaciones internacionales es otro lugar donde el Estado argentino apoya el ecosistema biotecnológico argentino. Y después con políticas con, concretas, el secretario Bailo eh, al principio de la jornada y luego Dalia comentaron del programa Biodesarrollar. Bueno, es un instrumento más de financiamiento con ANRs que se está dando eh, para la biotecnología o el sector biotecnológico en este caso. Así que bueno, no quería dejar de hacer esta breve introducción como para que eh, pa pasarle la palabra, P primero va, va a ser Martín o Agustín, o Carlos, Carlos, vos, vos primero, bueno, primero a Carlos Pérez que es el presidente de BioEuris, que nos va a contar los desarrollos eh, que, que, que tiene la, la empresa. Eh, y bueno, y luego pasemos a, a Biocells. Hola, hola. Bueno, buenos días. Eh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Para nosotros es siempre un gusto compartir lo que estamos haciendo y, y contar. Eh, y sobre todo creo que en esta interacción, como resaltaba Facundo, de circunstancias que hicieron posible que empresas pequeñas y medianas como la nuestra estén en, en el ecosistema internacional. Voy a aprovechar algunas... I thought we were having a translation, but we don't. So if, if you don't mind uh, completing the presentation in English. Okay, that's doesn't matter. That's, okay. I think that, that, yeah, I thought we did too. But um, anyway. English or Spanish? English, okay. Okay, doesn't matter. So it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here and share with you all the work we are doing in BioEuris. 
uh, since the last seven years. Uh, and thank you for the invitation uh, of ICA VR. We are working to develop sustainable with management system. This is what we do and the message is simple. Uh, less food, more, le less width, more food. This is the message. This is probably the initial point of bioeconomy trying to improve plants to get more chemical energy from sun. So maybe this is the starting point of the bioeconomy. And we have the possibility today to introduce more technology to go faster to develop more food or more chemical energy. So we have a value proposition based on different pillars which are reducing the environmental impact. This is something that society is demanding every day and is a must in all projects. Reducing time and cost of product development, we need a more dynamic uh, portfolio of tools to improve uh, cropping. And then share the value with seed companies. Uh, we have the opportunity to real democratize the access to the technologies. Nowadays, and from the last 20 years, technologies for crops were based on the big six, then the big four. Maybe Bioceles is an exception of that, but more of the technologies uh, were developed by only four companies, five, six companies in the world. So this is our pillars. And the, the market for this kind of technology is around 2 billion. So we are exploring a big market just for technologies. I mean, technologies not sit in that slide. Obviously the main crops, these are the four crops in which we are working on. Uh, the, the first crop is soybean, the, the more important, but we have really a, a big opportunity in sorghum to contribute to uh, food security. Uh, mainly in Africa, for example. And we have a big population eating rice all over the world, needing new tools to improve the, the cropping. And obviously we have a cotton as a big contribution to other no food crops. So this is uh, the, the four crops in which we are focused on. And we have two different platforms. We, we have a, an, an ambiguity in the company. We are really focused on products, but we think with platforms. We have a gene discovery platform. My name is Eric because we are developing a, a system to discover. It's not serendipity. We are not just finding, we are discovering. We have a synthetic biology platform. We based on microorganism. And we there discover the mutation that we want to introduce in the crops to optimize the crop. And then we have a gene editing platform uh, in which we just change one nucleotide, one letter in the whole genome with high precision. And with this, we can change a letter in the whole genome of a plant and we can do a work that can happen in nature, but in a couple of years. So we are in some way, and taking the words of Hugo in the previous presentation, exploring the biodiversity of the nature, but in a faster way. So this is really a, a, a key point on the regulation because main criteria to evaluate this new breeding techniques product is it can happen in nature. And, and this is the case, but it happened faster. And this is really the, the competitive advantage. We can do it in a half of the time and one order of magnitude less in cost, which is a, a big competitive advantage to develop new products. And let me introduce a comment. Facundo, please let me know when I am over time to, to I, I didn't take the, the time when I started. But we started working in soybeans. 
with a project uh, sponsored by a chemical company. They asked us to develop a new GMO technology. This was in 2015. This was at the same moment that Conavia introduced the regulation for gene edited products. And we purpose, okay, we can develop this GMO product with more than $30 million in 10 years, but we can do it in five, six, seven years with $5 million. Obviously the answer was, okay, go ahead with more risk, but with the gene edited product. So I, I, I say that because this regulation allow us to have a position over the ring to, to, to discuss technology with the bigger companies. So it was really important for us. We are working in four crops, uh, rice, soybean, sorghum, and cotton. The first product will be in the market in 2026, and it will be a rice, probably. We have edited plants in rice and in sorghum, and we will do the first field trials next season. And we were working with Conavia from the beginning, asking for uh, instancias de consulta previa, previous consult instance, maybe the translation. Sorry? Prior informed consent. So this allows us to ask who, what will be or should be the regulation status in the future when we will have the product, but four years in advance. And we decide if we follow this project or not, depending on the regulation in the future of this product. And this helps us a lot. So this is great. And, and we are working in that sense in these four crops. Probably the second will be soybeans and, and then sorghum. In particular, the, the sorghum is a, really an important crop uh, in, uh, in response to the climate change because it's a, a robust crops uh, from drought, for example. And, we, and there is a crop with no technologies, so just one all over the world. So we are introducing a couple of new technologies there. Mm, so in, in, in a way to the market, we are applying for patents in US covering the mutations and the technology to develop herbicide resistant technologies. We are working in advance to, to have the known GMO status uh, for the technologies we are developing in three countries at the same time, uh, in Argentina, in Brazil and US. It's a good notice that Dalia mentioned before that there is an harmonization in process between Brazil and, and Argentina. This is great. I think we have to work a lot to harmonize with Europe. We have there Today, probably we all have in the email the new regulation from Europe to read. And as I know, maybe they have two categories, but it's still some arbitrariety in the criteria. So we have to work with two. Okay. okay. And, and so we have to work with Europe to have a science based evaluation, but in case is, if it is not possible, we have to work more to export downstream in the value chain of the agriculture. Maybe this is a way to introduce not grain, not soybeans, but uh, oil, for example. So we have to work in it, but we, we are producing in America 100% uh, of soybeans or 90% of soybeans. So we have the power to, to move forward in that sense. And, and finally, and probably I will end with this slide. We have pre-commercial agreement with uh, seed companies, with independent seed companies. So this is, it has three different functions. We co-finance the projects. So we, as a small startup, need financial support to move forward in the pipeline. And we are doing that with the seed companies. The second point is we, have, we can 
improve the product concept because the seed company knows which is the trade to introduce to, to, to have more market share in their clients, the farmer. And, and then we have in this seed company, the channel to the market. So this point for us is really crucial because not only our work ends developing new products, we have to sell this product and, and, and have economical sustainability. So this, this point is, is really helping us. We have a lab in, in Rosario, 15 employees, a quality management system certified internationally. And we started the second lab in San Luis to work in the US during the pandemic. It's still a problem to have activity there because the pandemic depressed our activity there. And this is uh, the partnership, the seed companies uh, we are working with today, a chemical company and some enabling technologies companies to work with. So thank you very much. I, I hope it helps to understand how a small company interacts with the bigger in, in bioeconomy. Thank you. Hello, uh, good morning, uh, still good morning. We didn't have lunch yet. So uh, thanks, uh, Carl, for the invitation. Um, my name is uh, Martin Mariani. I, I am the global licensing leader for BioSeries Crop Solution. I am here with Agustin Biasioni, uh, which is a colleague, uh, also for BioSeries. He is uh, the senior VP of marketing. So uh, the idea is to try to, to share a little bit about BioSeries and just to put in focus into different projects or the main project that we are, uh, we can share with you as an example of what we are doing in, 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 in bioeconomy. So basically just a little background about BioSeries. BioSeries is an Argentinian company that was created in 2001, basically a group of growers that belong to the Argentinian No-Till Association. They decided to create a company to try to finance some funding, different projects that were under uh, public institutions like university or the National Research Council, which is the CONICET, is the name here in Argentina. So that was the start of the company. They were like 23 growers. Nowadays, it's more than 350 different shareholders. The majority are companies related with the agriculture, with the agribusiness. Basically, it start as a, with a lot of focus in agriculture. Then we expand to other kind of activities or projects or or or, or business, uh, and 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 the other important thing is that the from the beginning, BioSeries spirit was always collaboration between the private and the public sectors. That's why, as as Facundo mentioned and and, and Dalia mentioned before, we have a lot of projects and we have a lot of support of the government uh, for the different projects that became companies. And and I will try to to share with you. So. The BioSeries that I share with you is, is this BioSeries, what we call internally BioSeries Holding or BioSeries SA. So in 2001, as I mentioned, we only have three projects. Uh, and nowadays, it's this kind of network that I try to summarize. I don't want to bother you, but it's just we have like three main, uh, we can say, business units. One is BioSeries Crop Solutions, which is a, probably a company that nowadays is more renamed or more new in the market because we are, uh, make the IPO in, 20, in 2019. Now we are listed in the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. Basically inside BioSeries Crop Solution, we have all the products that are related with agriculture. We will get to some of the, or the main project that we have here. So inside BioSeries Crop Solution, we have HV4 technology that I will share with you. Rhizobacter, which is a biological company for seed treatment. And then we have other kind of companies that are related with other things, BioSeries services. Uh, I will share as an example of IMET. And then we have TIO, which is the recently uh, development of the company where we include companies that are related with uh, health and wellness, uh, functional foods, machinery or intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence. And also we have a venture where we support and finance with the Santa Fe government, another biotech company, a lot of startups that came basically from, from uh, 
uh, universities or, 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 or public institutions. So the idea is try to, to, to get into the two main, uh, for us is, is uh, the way to share with you what, what is the most advanced project that we are related with bioeconomy. So one uh, of our companies, it's called IMET. Uh, basically what we uh, do in IMET is try to use as Manuel uh, mentioned before, is try to use all the agro-industrial waste that could be the glycerin, the corn bicin, different derivatives from the sugar cane production, uh, also some uh, proteins waste of the industry. And with different tools, with metabolic synthetic biology fermentation, try to create high value molecules like bioplastic and seeing biopesticides and, and other things. So in this company, you have a lot of projects, but one that I think that it's pretty good to share with you and we include here is uh, in this bioplastic product that is the polyhydroxybutyrate that basically what we are doing is to produce from the waste of the biodiesel and from the corn industry, we produce this product, this bio plastic product that this product is a, a term plastic that is developed by bacteria, and they have a two main and important things you can use this as a uh, compost so you can uh, use this as a, a product that it's uh, bio uh, destroyed for the bacteria and the hongos in the soil but not only in the soil also in the water so in the period between 12 weeks to six months, this bioplastics is introduced in the soil or it will be destroyed in the water. So we start with a, uh, a bioreactor scale. So using this input, we create this bioplastic. Nowadays in Met in Rosario, we have uh, this scale bioreactor that we could use in our, around 1000 kilograms, we could produce like a couple of kilograms of bioplastic. But we think that this is the, uh, an alternative way uh, to replace the petroleum-based plastics. So with this product, you can put uh, or prepare films, bottles, and other kind of, of, of bioplastic things. So this is one of the, the, the most advanced projects in this kind of, 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 of tool or, 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 or project. Then the, the other project that we, we wanted to share with you that is a, a pretty novel product is what we call HV4 technology. HV4 technology is a drought tolerance uh, technology. Uh, it's a gene that was discovered in the sunflower. This discovery was made by a group of researchers that belong to the National, Littoral National University and the CONICET here in Argentina. So uh, since 2001, we started to work to develop this uh, gene and we introduced this gene in, in crops, mainly in wheat and in soybeans. So uh, in this case, uh, it's a GM crop. And we start to develop this gene uh, globally. Nowadays, uh, we have uh, approval in more than, than 10 countries around the world where this technology is approved, not only for cultivation, also for, for consumption. What is the main thing here is that we uh, believe and according more than 10 years of trialing here in Argentina is that this is a tool to uh, leverage or it's a tool to the growers to try to uh, give some fight to the climate change scenario. So uh, this technology allows the plants to pass through a draw uh, situation during the crop. So at the end of the day, what we allow to the plant is to defend against uh, a draw and, and a salinity uh, conditions. So what, what we are doing and try to link with the, with the, um, with the bioeconomy, and then I will let uh, uh, Agustin that continue with the presentation, is what we use HV4 technology as a, as a bridge, as a tool to try to promote a new way to produce food, a new way uh, to uh, develop technologies for agriculture. So basically, we launch what we call HV4 program, which is a, a regenerative agriculture program where we try to promote with the growers different things from crop uh, rotation, no-till, 
the replacement of the chemical of biologicals and reduce the use of chemicals, try to use another kind of fertilizer that have less impact in the environment, and try to make all this under a traceability program or a traceability uh, system. So that is what, what uh, we are doing. And now I will uh, let uh, Agustin that show to you more in numbers and, and, and try to put this that is in the sky in the ground. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. It's not that I, I am in the wrong conference. I think I'm in the right one, but I, I wanted just to share what we did what did what we did share two weeks ago in Vienna in the International Soybean Conference because it is very well related with the topic that we wanted to cover here. So, by the way, I, I, I am Austin Biasoni. I'm as Martin mentioned, I am the senior vice president of marketing of Biosales Crop Solutions. You will see here um, another company called Rhizobacter. This is the, the company that we use to produce all the biological products. Um, what I'm going to talk, uh, and that is part of the, the presentation that we did in, in Europe, was trying to challenge somehow the status quo. Uh, most of the presentations that I was seeing here today were related about how are we going to convince, promote, support bioeconomy. But I didn't see in many of the presentations the world consumers. So we are, we are thinking about how are we going to support and it's always like talking about the input that we need to put in it so this works. Uh, but we are just trying to think, what if we can think in a way that we can generate, generate pool from consumers so this can move along without the need of adding extra inputs? So in order to do that, what are the kind of things? How is society looking at agriculture, right? And that was great because if you ask a consumer about soybean, first, within the first 10 words that they, it will came to their mind is deforestation. So it is against you know what we are trying to promote, but at the same time, it is one of the it is the most spread uh, crop that can be produced without the need of adding nitrogen fertilizer because of the symbiosis that they can make with biological bacteria to fix nitrogen from the air. So, so if we consider that one metric ton of uh, gas is coming out of nitrogen is equivalent to 300 tons of carbon dioxide, we are thinking that soybean can be a great crop in terms of a challenge or just a, it, it affecting positively the climate change, right? And in order to do that one, we think that there are many kinds of things that consumers are looking at it. Most probably the only word, the only brand, when you ask consumers, there is only, there is a limited amount of papers talking about bioeconomy and how consumers think about it. But if you ask a consumer, would you like a bioeconomic bioeconomy product or would you like an organic product? Most probably they are going to take the organic, even though organic is the definition of what it doesn't have, not what it has, right? So one of the things that we need to think is like, is this a way consumers are generating pool demand here? Most of organic agriculture is being done under till agriculture. So we are tilling the ground in order to do organic agriculture. So that is going against climate change, but still consumers are demanding that. What can we do about that one? Is conventional agriculture? We don't think so, right? Uh, that was a, an interesting comment today within the common questions that were after the panel uh, before this one that was saying, uh, what about the, the way we are doing things and, and so forth? And Argentina is leading leader uh, country in terms of uh, no-till. And one of the things here that is interesting is if you ask a consumer, they would say you have organic agriculture and conventional agriculture. And conventional agriculture, you have monoculture of soybean and crop rotation with cover crops and so forth. And for a consumer, it is exactly the same thing. And we need to challenge that one. And one of the ways that we are supporting in order to go in that direction is regenerative agriculture. Why? Because that allows setting a starting point that it will be a minimum to entry into that level and a continuous improvement, improvement process that it won't be the same for each of the people, the people or the companies that are apl applying to, but it will be progressive. So each company, depending on their needs, the possib their possibilities, their, their location, they will be able to start from a different uh, ground and set a path to improve, the, uh, to improve their. So that in reality, it's important because if we don't challenge and we don't tackle that one, everything that we are going to do in bioeconomy will depend on how are we subsidizing that one, and that is not sustainable, by the way. What are we doing? And I am just, just this was a longer presentation, but I wanted just to keep uh, some of the highlights there. 
what if we can just analyze and compare all the inputs that we are using in agriculture regarding different kinds of factors. One is return on carbon investment. That means if I pay $1 of this product, what is the return in carbon that I am going to get compared to the same alternatives that I can use, chemical ones, when I use a biological products like ours, compared to the chemical alternatives to that one. And you can see here how each of those products is compared. Same things in terms of greenhouse uh, gases, in terms of harmful materials, in terms of human toxicity, in terms of ecosystem impact, aquatic toxicity, and soil toxicity. So if we can deliver products to farmers that will allow them to be more sustainable, and when we talk about sustainable, it's not like a nice word that we want to have in, in all our PowerPoint presentations, but something that you can really, uh, really measure. This is something that uh, will provide enough information to have better decisions and incline those decisions uh, towards uh, uh, challenging the, the, the climate change. Last uh, thing that I want to that, that talk about it is like, how do we put all this together? Martin was mentioning about HV4 production, right? And what we are doing is, I will, I will spoil my, my next slide, but we are doing more than 50,000 hectares for the last, and we have been doing that for the last three years. And those hectares were done measuring the ecotoxicological impact of each of them. So even though we are not taking advantage of that one, one of the things that we are trying to do is being able to produce a commodity with traceability that will, we will know exactly what is the amount of carbon dioxide, uh, what was exactly being used. And that allow us also to have very, I, I, I personally love that one, but we were just talking about HV4, maybe, you know, so, you, some of you know, but we were launching a transgenic wheat, right? And people was talking about transgenic wheat and, wheat and so forth. And one of the questions that we did to consumer was, would you rather take, we had some of the hectares that were completely free of agrochemicals, right? So we did a transgenic completely free of ag agrochemicals. It's, it's funny because if you look at it, besides the fact that it's GM, GM um, crop, it is organic because it doesn't have chemicals, right? So we asked consumers, would you take, would you prefer a transgenic wheat, right? That is coming out of, uh, is certified free of agrochemicals or would you, or would you prefer a conventional one that might have chemicals as most of the, uh, the, the, the wheat that, you can, that we are consuming? And so surprisingly, and not that much for us, consumers were always opting for the agrochemical thing, for the one that is free of agrochemicals, right? So that opens tons of opportunities because we were tying those technologies together. We were thinking consumers are against of GM. And apparently what we are seeing in, a, in the bread, right, is that consumers are against of, of agrochemical products more than uh, they are against transgenics. That might open tons of opportunities for us and uh, in order to explore different paths to uh, just to, to, to face the climate change. What we are doing here basically is like we take what the, the same farmers that we are uh, produce, that, that is producing using certain technologies, we add our biologicals into that one, including uh, our HV4 seeds. And we can see what is the gap that we are going to have at the end in terms of carbon intensity to produce that crop. At the same time, that what is the uh, ecotoxicological index that we are going to have in, the, in, in that regard. The good thing about ecotoxicological index is that will allow the farmer to know how are they compare one year over the other year and so forth and keep improving. And at the same time, telling the story to the chain. For example, we are working in, <clears throat> sorry, in North America with companies such as Nestle, Danone and so forth, trying to see we can be the ones producing at a large scale in a collaborative mode with farmers, all these kind of inputs that will have a, a measuring of that one. And this in terms of yield will have better yield than the conventional one. So we are, just not, do, not going organic because that is not sustainable because you need more acres. If you need more acres, you need to go over deforestation. But using the hectares that we are, increasing productivity by using biological products properly uh, and uh, the right ones in the, in the field. Just some numbers to, to support what I was saying. We, are, we have 292 uh, farmers. If we consider uh, Bioceres isolated, it's probably one of the largest wheat producers in the world and most probably in Latin America, within more than 50,000 hectares uh, of wheat with farmers without owning the land. And we were giving them a protocol 
with all those characteristics that we want in terms of the environmental profile of the farms that we are using, right? That, uh, that covers this amount of farmers within the, the, the different uh, um, crops that those farmers are using and the cycles that goes us uh, to many uh, crops uh, cycles. Uh, and we have, in, uh, let me just uh, focus on this, more than 80,000 hectare plant, uh, hectares planted uh, with these kind of conditions. We are so far not just getting uh, any kind of uh, benefit from the market other than the traceability that we have, but in the future, we are going to have this information and by using digital tools and uh, uh, all the information to have sensors in the farm and remote technologies, we are able to measure most of the variables that we can tie that information to the commodities that we are, that we are selling. As you can see here, we have different ways to measure the ecotoxicological impact. One is coming from, uh, from here, from the University of Buenos Aires. And the other one is like e, uh, EIQ, that is coming from Cornell University in the US. It doesn't, well, we say each of them will have a different kind of variables, but what they take is the toxicity profile that you have in the registered products in the market. They will evaluate it, they will assess them, and they, you will be able to compare in terms of the rate that you apply, when do you apply it, how do you apply it, and that will give you an index that you can compare to other farmers as well as to yourself in different kind of years. I think that, yeah, what I want is uh, what I want to summarize and uh, in my presentation is like there is a different way using biological inputs. Biological inputs doesn't need to be like for niche agriculture, but it can be for massive agriculture, and that can be real in a collaborative mode with different kind of farmers multiplying this kind of impact. And just to mention why biologicals are not a niche thing, Rhizobacter it's the most relevant player in producing soybean soybean inoculants in the world. And if we consider that we are, soybean is one of the most spread crops in the world, and that we are in 23% of the treated acreage, uh, acreage of, of, the, of soybean, we are thinking that it's the most important biological spread globally in different things. And it is coming out of here, of Argentina, where it was growing together with no-till. So that is part of what we wanted to share today. I hope that was useful for you. Happy to have any kind of discussion. Thank you. Uh, ask uh, Maria to, uh, to start our discussion. Um, we'll, uh, you know, I think it might be lunchtime, but we'll uh, take a little bit of lunchtime in order to understand um, what we've just heard here and to, to uh, give us some time to uh, digest and think about it. Okay, thank you, Carl. Uh, well, my job is to bring out the environmental questions, issues, um, Carl uh, designated that role. So I'm, I'm uh, it, it, it may be a delicate task, but the first thing I wanted to do is, Carlos, we may have rushed you through your presentation. So I wanted to ask you if you can go uh, in deeper into the environmental benefits, the climate change benefits, how your product um, reduces emissions or somehow helps farmers adjust to, to new climate conditions? Well, it's part of our <clears throat> value proposition, reduce environmental impact of the practices to do with management. So we use the same system of, from Cornell to evaluate the impact of the current solutions, and we are choosing herbicides that uh, decrease the environmental impact. And by the other hand, we are, our gene editing powerhouse allow us to have a more dynamic combination of uh, herbicide resistant traits. So we, our approach is we can do more sustainable the technologies along the time. We are using, we are starting using one herbicide resistant technology for almost 20 years. And then this technology had broken and we have to choose another one and it will broke again. So our value proposition is to combine and do by this way, uh, uh, 
a decreasing in environmental impact value and more sustainable the technologies along the time. And by this way, we are, I think the message, uh, there are two key messages. One is plus technology, less environmental impact. We have to use this, I think, as industry to, to spread our message over many uh, cultures trying to not to use technologies to produce. So I, I think we all will agree here that more technology decreases environmental impact. And the other key message is less weeds, it's more food. So we are transforming light energy into chemical energy using water and nutrients. And we share this with weeds competing with the for the resources so with the best with management system we can improve the efficiency to do this by economy process it's changing kind of energies so in that way uh, is we can contribute for the sustainability okay thank you well now that i made the special question for you i'll have a question for both of you about Something that is often said about, you know, high technology products, which is um, it's questioned how accessible they are to the small and medium farmer uh, if uh, due to cost or due to the other inputs that are needed or to the high technology machinery, the size and cost of the machinery, or even uh, because they can no longer keep the seeds that they used to. That was a traditional uh, practice. Uh, so what do you, what is your response uh, to this, to this issue? How could, does your product, does your product do this or not? For me? Or... For both, for both companies, you can take, well, you, okay. uh, maybe Bioceres can ask, uh, can answer now. Well, thanks, thanks for the, the question. Uh, so in our case, basically, and, and, and it's one of the points that, that Carlos mentioned is in their presentation, uh, Bioceres is a company that it was established by growers. So the, the spirit is totally different than the other companies, probably that uh, develop biotechnology uh, globally. Uh, in our case, uh, so we need to split at that. It's uh, one thing is the intellectual property thing, and the other thing is the rights of the of the growers to keep seed and save seed. It's not related really with a technology standpoint or technology access. It's more with the intellectual property thing. So basically in in, uh, in South America or at least in Argentina, we have a, a complicated situation related to that and more in seeds and, and, and in soybean and wheat basically that the both crop that we work. Um, nowadays, uh, just to, to try to answer uh, in the easy ways, for us, is any grower in Argentina could access to HB4, could be joined to the to the program. As Auti mentioned, it will depend just to to join to the company, to the to the not to the company, to the program, and and fulfill all the requirements that we request from the environmental standpoint and best practices. Uh, but the thing is, again, uh, our position as a uh, company that develop technologies is that. As you know, all the companies have investors and we need to, to defend the, the, the investment that we did as a company to develop new technology. So the intellectual property thing, I think that this is the point uh, probably that is totally different on the access of the technology. One thing is the access of the technology. Another thing is the intellectual property piece, you know, but that is. Just one more thing to add on top of that one is like, uh, and I, I like facts. So if we consider 20 years ago, <clears throat> I don't recall exactly if it is 20 or 30 years ago, Brazil used to be the same yield per hectare in soybean than Argentina. Today, Brazil is one metric ton more than Argentina, while in Brazilian farmers are not keeping their seeds and they are buying seeds every single year, right? And all the royalties that they are paying for seeds is lower than one metric ton. So that is the answer to the question. So value generated. And if they want to use things that is are, uh, that are right now using, they want to still keep their seeds, they can keep using that one. But you can start adding a lot of benefits on top of that one. And we have fact, facts in terms of how, how, the, how that evolved in, in Argentina and how that evolved in, in Brazil, a neighbor country where 
conditions are, are similar in here. And how about the other side of the question? Because I kind of, when I, I uh, mentioned the seed issue, I kind of uh, diverted the question towards that. How about the other question of access to, because of the scale, in investment scale, the scale of the machinery, the type of the technology, maybe even knowledge that um, producers have to have, do you think it is accessible to smaller producers or is it something that tends towards a larger scale? Because we were saying in the previous presentations, it was mentioned how many uh, small producers there are in Latin America. No? Um, so how does is this technology suitable for these smaller producers? Well, I think that's, let, it's okay, yeah. So uh, I think this is a great question. And again, let me go over some examples on, on that one. But mostly about the biological seeds is seed. So whatever you can put a seed with one technology that is inside, you can apply it by a small or a, a, or a big farmer, right? In terms of biologicals, for example, it is applicability of biological is key. You have many biologicals that applying them in a crazy way might work, but that is not applicable as you well said. But most of the ones that we said, and I think that is a crucial piece that companies need to work out is how those can be well applied in the system without many changes. And that involves small and large scale farmers. When we talk about large scale farmer, farmers, you need to keep a bacteria, for example, alive for up to 120 days in, in countries like Brazil, where temperatures are above 35 Celsius. And that is a challenge. And that is adapting the technology for them. And at the same time, we had been working, we were uh, discussing with, with a colleague from, from Kenya, and we had been doing uh, trials with Kenya seeds and. Uh, in, in, in there in Kenya, using uh, the same kind of biologicals, sending them together with a big bag so they can put their corn seeds. They were not hybrids, they were varieties, and they were applying the 25 ml uh, uh, pouch of uh, uh, biological products, applying it there, just shaking it, doing the treatments, and they were uh, hand, hand replanted. So companies need to be adapted on that one. And for sure, having an extra SK, SKU for a 25 ml sachet while you can have a 20 liters when you go to, to Brazil or all other big countries such as Argentina or the US, um, it is different, it's a complication, but then you have the convictions of companies to approach those, mar those markets. Just a point to, to add on that. We think that this kind of technology like gene editing can really democratize the access and, and it's in different levels. A trade development company uh, at the price to develop the product is much less. Small companies can participate in the market. Then the reduction can be shared with the seed companies and the farmers. And in our case, the business case works with prices set in the half of the current prices of the same technologies. So this value created is shared with seed companies and farmers. And then I think the availability of the technologies. When you have a brilliant position to develop technologies, you can set your own prices and limit the access. In some crops, not in soybeans, but in many crops, there is just a couple of technologies, one company, that develop these technologies and license out the technologies with their own germoplasm. So this limit the access to the small seed companies to the technologies with their own germoplasm and these have a dominant position regarding prices. So I think as much technologies we have to share or to bring farmers uh, more access. This is the point. Okay, thank you. Do you want us to take questions from the floor? Because I have millions of more questions, but maybe our public has. Um, so do we have any any questions? No? Well, I, I can go on then. Uh, <laughs> I was, um, I think one of the most delicate issues is biodiversity, how your uh, product does not affect biodiversity. One thing that was mentioned by Biocetis is that it prevents the expansion. It produces in with a higher yield, you produce in a, a more, you know, you, you don't expand the agricultural frontier as much, so you don't deforest. But there are also issues about 
how your uh, genetic material might affect biodiversity, surrounding biodiversity. Um, what is your, your take on that? In our case, it's really simple. We are creating biodiversity in our gene discovery platform. We use plant genes, we do random mutagenesis and site-directed mutagenesis over these genes to discover mutation that are biodiversity. So it had happened in nature over 10 years in thousands of hectares and it will name us biodiversity. We can do it in a couple of years in the lab. We are accelerating biodiversity in, in our platform. But, but that question, this, does your biodiversity, can it crossbreed with the natural variety? We introduce yes. this biodiversity in, in natural uh, varieties mm -hmm. to help the farmers to produce more with less land, for example. For some people, if your if your um, your product crosses and breeds with a natural corn, for example, that would be contamination. So I'm I'm bringing out the issues that are on the floor, so we can we can have your opinion on that. Uh, sure, I, I think just a comment, a short comment more. Uh, this is more regarding the way to produce mm -hmm. in the land. We have only one technology over the four main crops in all the land, we have a big problem. If we have more different technologies in many different crops, we have diversity. So this prevents this problem, I think. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe you can just shout it out. Um. Philip Grundmann from the Agricultural Engineering and Bioeconomy Institute in Germany. Um, it was really pleasant to, to hear, you know, the success stories of your companies. And I imagine you have a bright future and growing, uh, but, uh, can you also say a little bit about what are the limitations are there for you and in terms of yeah growth and is it about rules regulations about markets consumers what what is it really i would be interested thank you i i can i can i can go so um it's uh, for us nowadays in the in the stage that we are thanks for for the questions uh and it's something that came up here is the the regulatory frame, no, uh, the regulatory frame uh, that basically the trend that is coming from Europe, I think that is the the, the main challenge that we have, because uh, from our perspective, is it's more than uh, we can say that uh, every every year Europe starts to request more things. That's from the technical standpoint, we can say that. It doesn't have a lot of sense. So, uh, so basically, that is the main challenge. So the regulatory, because you have countries that uh, have regulatory frames, the other ones that doesn't have, the others have a, a lot of things that sometimes are not related with really with the product. So that's one of the things, the regulatory aspects. Uh, as as Auti mentioned, we thought that we will have more pushback from the consumers, uh, mainly with our product in wheat. And nowadays we are seeing that we are moving forward and, and that kind of barriers are going down because the approach that we are doing is more related with, with this, with environmental aspect, carbon footprint. But now with the current world situation worldwide, the, the food safety issue, it's coming more and more. So, um, for us nowadays, if I have to, to say it's in, in this moment, it's more the, the, the regulatory. It's a lot of money that you need to invest to develop and, re, and fulfill all the requirements from the different countries. Uh, so for, for a company uh, like us, it's, it's, it's the, main, the main challenge. It's a, it's, it's a big challenge nowadays. Despite of that, we move a lot. We have approvals globally, also in wheat, in Australia, New Zealand, US, uh, South Africa, Indonesia, uh, but uh, when you need to start to get more approvals, it's a, that you need to invest more money, more time, 
and that it's not related with with your product in the ground it's more related with your the commercialization of of your product and more for argentina as this uh, uh, a main export country and i don't know if I, yes could i follow up just to uh, you know on the sort of rhizobacter uh, side of things i mean is with with biologicals there are also substantial regulatory um challenges is is that right are you running into some of those i mean is rhizobacter developing new types of uh, inoculum and stuff like that 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 are facing challenges yes exactly I, I was going to say that the main and the main kind of issue that we are facing are regulatory issues right uh, first is whenever you do innovation so all regulations goes behind you know always follow behind right so it, it never is proactive so when you launch something that is unique that might really be tackling down with scientific proof all the, the the things that you need to tackle it will take more time from the regulatory standpoint because you need to create regulation go through that regulation and move it forward so uh, just to achieve the goals that we have for 2030 if we consider that in e eu for example getting a biological register right now it's anywhere between five to seven years so we are there so whatever we are not right now ready to to start a registration process we are not going to make it for 2030 when the green deal is, to, is going to start pushing us all and mostly european farmers because um, what is happening is like regulatory things are being pushed for how things are being produced in europe and the, the then, then you, you start importing things that might have different requests than the things that you produce in in, in europe it, itself so i would say regulatory and just to talk about the positive things is like you are seeing countries such as brazil that are fasting up that incredibly this kind of thing so whatever is biologicals we are going to go over the biosafety and move forward forget about efficacy we need to move fast they understood that if we really want to change this and agriculture is responsible you know agriculture forestry and, and, and as well as cattle production is responsible for 25 percent of the greenhouse em emissions we don't have time to lose so We'd rather move fast, go deeply and uh, over the biosafety, and you're going to get a registration. That allows by countries such as Brazil to be one of the ones that is using the, the, the highest amount of biologicals in extensive in row, in row crop agriculture compared even to Europe, right? So I think that regulatory, it's it's one of those those things. Even in biologicals, not only in, in the genetic peaks, that for sure it takes more time. And the worst thing is, rather than being better, is getting worse. So it's like it used to be four to six years in the, in the past. Now we are in about five to seven. Well, one of the things I, I want to clarify is that to me, gene banks are the answer to my previous question. I mean, if you're going to affect, you, you have natural systems, you want to keep those, that genetic material alive. You don't stop technology, but you make fewer, you, you know, bioprospecting. Uh, you do your bioprospecting and you you keep your uh, your genetic material somewhere. But um, I have uh, the opposite question from the previous one, which is where do you see this going? I mean, if you you know your technology, what do you think? What are the opportunities and possibilities for improving, um, you know, reducing impact, environmental impact, um, assuring sustainability into the future? beyond what you're doing now where do you see it in the future what are the opportunities that you see in the future where can we go into the wider bioeconomy if you go for so you were talking about crops maybe there's a wider applications yeah. yeah so i was going to start from from the bigger number so most of the emissions in a crop are coming from the crop residues at the same time that the organic matter we are trying to fix into the ground. So if we are able to just uh, use that biomass that we are producing there somehow uh, to produce materials, other kind of things, and, and, and so forth, we are reducing that one at the same time that respecting and, and just putting into the ground uh, still some organic matter and transferring that one into any kind of materials for construction, for whatever, that will also help. To reduce the carbon emissions so we are reducing the carbon emissions because we rather than mineralizing that one we are utilizing that residue and at the same time we can be uh, uh, we, we can be in, um, reducing the amount for example of cement 
that is like one of the biggest em emission uh, factors of emission in the world. Yes, exactly. Adding to 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 um, Agustin' comment, we have some of the project in the company that this use the um, the crops waste. So all the things that keep in the in the ground after harvest and use that to build houses. So that's one of the things. The other things that we are uh, developing also is uh, some bacteria that you can reduce or or use the lignin that came from the chips from the forestry and try to do that and and and, and transform in, in biofuel or other kind of product that have uh, use in the industry. So that's like you make like a closed loop or, or, or recycle that and, and that uh, will have a, a, an impact. And then it's a, a lot of things that are going on, uh, but um, crops, biologicals, and, and the, the use of the, of the West, of the West of the agri-industrial products, I think that are the, the trends. So uh, in our case, we think that the, the, we see the future with the interaction of these mm, two platforms uh, with the gene editing machine, the gene editing powerhouse, we will be able to introduce many different traits into crops, into commodities or, or minor crops. And the challenge is to identify what to edit. This is the, the challenge and we are working a lot at this first step uh, with mutation confirmed every cyber system, the next step for us is allelopathies. So to improve crops, to fight with weeds without herbicides, to replace the herbicides. And to, uh, as we have more bio herbicides, but we don't know the mechanism of action of these new bio herbicides. But in the near future, we will have the, the knowledge of how it works and we can develop resistance to convert this bio herbicide in selectives. And then for gene editing in general, I think the point is to introduce quality uh, abilities in the crops, eliminate anti-nutrients, modify the fatty acid composition. Uh, we have many different things, introduce higher level of vitamins. So we have a, a really, a, a, a great uh, box of tools to develop new crops. And just a point from your previous uh, answer or the, from the public, I agree regarding the, the challenge uh, about regulation. And I think, and I think you will agree, we need to incorporate in the conversation the traders. Because when every regulatory step is complete, then we have public perceptions and the traders. So we have to introduce them in the conversation. I think we'll, oops, sorry. We'll stop here so that uh, we can still get a, a little bit of lunch if you're interested. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, it's very interesting uh, conversation. And uh, of course, the, the one thing that, uh, is interesting with with your I guess you guys are the marketing guys right um, so uh, you know the the concept and concern about um, uh, you know all these these ways of, of reducing waste and and all that I, I'm wondering if it's going to make um, some people that invest in Nasdaq nervous that you guys are not thinking enough about profits and are thinking too much about the environment, you know? <laughs> anyway, this was, this was really great. I, I hope you'll hang around for a little while. And um, uh, thanks all of you for, for hanging with us for, for a while. And, uh, and thank you, Maria and Facundo. Uh, and um, as, uh, I, I found it really interesting uh, session. I guess I organize these things in terms of what I can learn.